with everything crazy in public. All right, here we uh, here we are. Let's let's just uh, pause to summarize uh, what we understand now on the basis of the Westminster Confession of Faith. Uh, we understand our origins. We understand that we are created by God. We understand the problem of evil. That, are, that evil originates outside of God and outside of humanity. Uh, all that God made is good, and so evil is good gone bad. I think that's another Augustinian definition, good gone bad. Uh, the problem of humanity, we are great, made in the image of God, and we are deeply flawed. We are both Beethoven's Ninth Symphony and Auschwitz. We are the smartphone and the gulags. The rest of the Westminster Confession of Faith is about God's solution to problems two and three. So we begin the solution. Chapter seven, God's covenant with man. The distance between God and the creature is so great that although reasonable creatures do owe obedience on him as their creator, Yet they could never have any fruition of him as their blessedness and reward, uh, but by some voluntary condescension on God's part, which, God, which he hath been pleased to express by way of a covenant. So that, that's talking about humanity even pre-fall. Okay, and we, we have no access to God. We have no way uh, to know him, to enjoy him, except that uh, by God condescends to us voluntarily. So um, the confession is saying we, we would still owe obedience to him, but the distance there between the infinite and the finite, uh, between God and all the creatures, uh, that we, we could not know him in any kind of a positive sense. He would not, we would not um, know him in a way that is... Um, blessed, we would not know him by way of reward, and yes, God is pleased to make himself known to us. And how, has he done that? Yes, he's done that, and he does, he's done it by way of covenant. All right, so what is a covenant? Question number seven. Yeah, I think, you know, I think you can, you can, use, um, you can use the language of contract. It's a contract. Uh, and it, it, um, the children's catechism uh, calls it uh, a, um, what is a covenant? It is a, an agreement between two or more persons. Uh, so that I think that's the basic definition of it. When, it's, when, it, the, when they are divine covenants, then like John Murray, you want to add sovereignly imposed, sovereignly administered. So, you know, we don't negotiate the covenant with God. In contracts you negotiate, you know, they say they want $250,000 for the house and you'll, you say, well, I'll give you two thirty and you know, there's negotiating uh, in human contracts. That's not the case with God. They're unilaterally imposed. Uh, I think also it's important to add that there's like, we have skin in the game on them. So like the stakes are high and we're maintaining your end of the contract. And it's not just like, oh, if we fail, then sorry. Uh, but they're like, there's a gravity to them. To them. Yes, in, even though it's unilaterally imposed. Yeah, the obligations, you know, God promises to do things, which he's not obligated to do, promises to do things, but he requires things from us. And if we fail to do those things, then we are subject to his displeasure. The first covenant made with Adam was a covenant of works, wherein life was promised to Adam and in him to his posterity upon condition of perfect and per personal obedience. Um, so... Uh, question number eight, why must the initiative in covenant making always be with God? We've just answered that. If he doesn't initiate, it doesn't happen. He is remote. He is distant. He is infinite. He is at infinite distance from us. We have no access to him. He must initiate. What's the difference between the covenant of works and the covenant of grace, and what made the latter necessary? So the confession is arguing that... Um, that there was a covenant of works in the garden w w wherein life was promised to Adam and to his posterity upon the condition of perfect and personal obedience. And then, paragraph 3, man by his fall 
having made himself uncapable, we would say incapable, of life, by that covenant, um, I've noted in the, in, the, in the margins here, that covenant of works is, is in the shorter catechism, question number 12, called a covenant of life, uh, life on the basis of uh, uh, perfect and personal obedience. Uh, Leviticus 18.5 um, says, do this and you shall live. Do this, do the commands, and life will be uh, granted. But having made ourselves uncapable, uh, un uncapable of life by that covenant, meaning the covenant of works, do this and you shall live. We're not capable of doing this and we will live. We cannot do that law. We don't have that capacity any, any longer. We're guilty for not keeping that law, but we don't have the capacity to keep it either. Because if James, back to James 2, 10, and, and um, uh, Ephesians, Ephesians 3, no, Galatians, James 2, 10, Galatians 3, 10, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the law to perform it. If you keep the whole law, you stumble at one point, you're guilty of all. We don't have the capacity to keep the law of God in the way that it's required. We stumble at point after point after point. So God was pleased then to make a second commonly called the covenant of grace wherein he freely offered to unto sinners life and salvation by Jesus Christ requiring of, the, of them faith in him that they may be saved and promising to give unto all those that are ordained unto eternal life his Holy Spirit to make them willing and able to believe. So question number nine, what's the difference uh, between the covenant of works and the covenant of grace? What made the latter necessary? Failure of the former. <laughs> yes. Uh, the second was necessary because we failed at the first. And we, um, we are, because of the corruption that has been passed on to us, uh, renders us incapable of fulfilling the requirements of the law. Yes? Why would God make a covenant he would need to replace? For or does he replace the covenant? For his glory. Yeah, the, the ultimate answer to every question is for his own glory. Because it, that, um, and, um, so I, you know, we said earlier in this, in the evening that uh, were there no fall, were there no redemption, um, there's no, there's, the, the display of the attributes of God is not as clear and emphatic as it is because of the fall and because of redemption. It's because of the fall, because of redemption, that we have a clearer picture of the goodness and the grace and the mercy and the love of God, and then we have of the righteousness and justice and uh, wrath and holiness of God. Well, yes, without the law, there is no knowledge of sin. But why make a whole covenant about the law that can't be, that we are incapable of fulfilling to come and fulfill it? Like, I guess, because covenants are a big thing. We got the Abrahamic covenant as well as the Noahic and, and other things. Why, like, it, it almost looks like to me he's torn down something that he built earlier. Um. I mean, the answer to why is, uh, according to the confession, God was pleased. But the Lord was pleased. To fulfill the original covenant, Jesus so that covenant was still really in place, right? He's the only one that had, for, had true free will to do good or evil, and he fulfilled that first covenant, so it right. was still... Right, so what the confession is saying is that there was a covenant of works in the garden, Adam failed. Is the covenant of works still in, is it still uh, in place? Yes, it is. And so it continues to be the case that if you do this and you shall live. Leviticus 18.5 is still true. Do this and you shall live. We're just not capable of doing it. So God further condescends and provides a way of salvation since we are not capable of keeping that first covenant. And Jesus comes and then fulfills the covenant of works, which is the point. So here's some of the scriptural basis for what we're saying. Um, Le Le Leviticus 18.5 is quoted twice in the New Testament, Galatians 3.12, Romans 10.5. You, you shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules. If a person does them, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. 
Um, Jesus cites it in Luke 10, 28. And he said to them, you have answered correctly. This is to the rich young ruler, uh, having cited, uh, the ruler having cited a number of the commandments. You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Um, and then Jesus says, well, sell over your head and give it to the poor and come follow me. And he proved that he was in violation of the very first and probably the second and third commands as well because he'd made an idol out of his wealth. So he was, he, uh, uh, his wealth meant more to him than following Jesus. Uh, so that, that meant that he had not kept the law. Um, from Romans 5, again, if we look at this carefully, sin came into the world through one man and death through sin. So sin spread to all men because all sinned in Adam. Uh, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin was not counted where there is no law. It's not, in other words, it's not defined. It's not defined the way it is when the law uh, uh, spells out exactly what it means to sin. Through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Sin is anomia. It is lawlessness, anti-law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even of those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type. Adam is a type of the one who was to come. He is a type of Christ. He is standing in relation to the human race in the same uh, position as Adam. So if Ad what if Adam had not sinned? What if, what if he had fulfilled this uh, testing period, whatever, the, whatever the, the length of that period was, we don't know, but there was some kind of a probation, and if he kept the law, what would have happened? He would have secured eternal life for all of his descendants. And sin would never have come into the world, and the kingdom of God wouldn't have been established at the very beginning. So then Christ comes as uh, uh, fulfilling. He is the antitype to which the type pointed, and he is obedient in, in all those places where Adam was disobedient. And so he fulfills the covenant of works, and in doing so then inherits eternal life for all of his descendants. So keep that explanation in mind and see if it doesn't fit what's being said. The free gift is not like the trespass, ten, tr uh, trespass, for if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man. So the one man of the, of the previous verses is now the one man Jesus Christ, it's no longer uh, the one man who was Adam. Uh, now it's the one man, Jesus Christ. So, so what Adam was is a foreshadowing. He is a type of, uh, of what Christ, of the Christ who would come and do what Adam failed to do. Uh, the, the, uh, so the free gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin, for the judgment... Um, for the judgment following one tra trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, see, see the repetition of the, the one man, you know, the one man's sin, the one man's trespass uh, uh, through that one man, much more will those receive the abundance of grace and free gift of righteousness reign through that one man, this time, not Adam, uh, but Jesus Christ. Uh, continuing in Romans 5. Therefore, as one trespass led to the con condemnation of all men, the one trespass of the one man that results in condemnation of all men, so one act, so one trespass then parallels the one act of righteousness leads to justification in life for there's the all men here. Here's the all men here. See the parallelism? That's, he's, I mean, he's clearly drawing the parallels between the two. For as by the, the one man's disobedience, that's Adam, the many were made sinners. There's the transmission of the corruption. So by one man's obedience, Adam did not obey. He forfeited eternal life for himself and for his descendants through good works. The second Adam, Christ, comes, and it's by his obedience that he secures eternal life for all of his progeny. The many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more.
Uh, B.B. Warfield believed on the basis of that verse and others that there would be more people in heaven than will be in hell because the second Adam is greater than the first Adam. I don't know if that is true, but I'm just telling you that's what Warfield believed. Um, uh, No, you know they had, they had uh, Warfield and the Hodge both had kind of a kind of a cheap route to uh, populating heaven. They believed that all infants dying in infancy would be in heaven. So if you go back to the yeah, original, I the, believe that as well. yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, that, they're saying that that's how po heaven will be populated with more b uh, believers than hell with unbelievers. Was that all all the infants throughout all the ages would be in heaven? Which I believe they will be too. But it just seems kind of like a backdoor way of. I don't, I don't, I don't. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, so are, have, we question, have we answered question number nine? I think that we have. Question 10, the, uh, the administration of the covenant of grace under law was sufficient and efficacious to do what? How were Moses and David saved? So paragraph. Yes. I know you're afraid to ask. This is right on subject, though. David and Moses were they both given the power to have the faith by the Holy Spirit? Of course, yes. they wouldn't believe if they weren't okay. regenerate. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, so this. Uh, so paragraph four, the covenant of grace is frequently set forth in scripture by the name of a testament in reference to the death of Christ, Jesus Christ, the testator, and to the everlasting inheritance with all things belonging to it therein bequeathed. The covenant was differently administered in the time of the law and in the time of the gospel. Under the law, it was administered by promises, prophecies, sacrifices, circumcision, the Paschal Lamb, and other types and ordinances delivered to the people of God, the Jews, all for signifying Christ to come. So stop there. Uh, the question is, um, well, let's keep, yeah, let's keep going because I stopped right before the answer. Um, for signifying the Christ to come, which were, for that time, sufficient and efficacious through the operation of the Spirit to instruct and build up the elect in faith in the promised Messiah by whom they had the full remission of sins and eternal salvation and is called the Old Testament. So what was it sufficient and efficacious to do to point to Christ, right? Because Hebrews says the blood bulls and goats can't put away sin. So there was no final efficacy in in animal sacrifices in the temple. Those animal sacrifices were to point to the Lamb of God that would take away the sin of the world. So question number 10, um, as to were they able to see through the types of the Old Testament, were they able to see through them to a Savior, a Redeemer? Could they see in the lambs being sacrificed the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world? Could they see through the high priest, their great high priest, that was coming? Could they see at the Passover that Christ our Passover would be sacrificed for us? Um, here's what Jesus says. If you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. So what's the Pentateuch about? Moses wrote of me. Uh, Acts 3 um, 18 and then uh, 24, but what God foretold by the mouth of the prophets that, that is Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. And all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel to those who came after him also proclaim these days, what days? Gospel days. So you've got Jesus saying, look, it's all about Christ. So, so just step back and look at the big picture. What's the Bible about from Genesis to Malachi? It's all about bringing the Messiah into the world. It's the whole point. And it goes back to uh, Genesis 3.16 and the promise that the seed of the woman 
would bruise the head of the serpent, and then the rest of the story is about the unfolding of, of that seed, the seed singular of the woman who would be Mary, bringing forth the Savior who would bruise the head of the serpent and save his people. Uh, so, the outlandishness of that statement to the Pharisees, you can't even, can't even imagine for Jesus, yeah. for somebody to say, you know, your scriptures, all the scriptures you study, it's me, yeah. it's about me. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so, so it, it's not, it is not an exaggeration to say that the whole Old Testament is about the process by which Christ comes into the world. From Abraham to Isaac to Jacob to Joseph, you know, to Moses to Joshua, right on through the prophets to John the Baptist, and then he comes. In the fullness of time, God sends forth his son, Galatians 4.4. 4. Uh, continuing, your, Abra uh, your father Abraham rejoiced, Jesus says, that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. He was able to see it. He's able to see it through the, the prophecies and the promises. Um, Acts 2, uh, the, uh, Peter uh, interpreting Psalm 16, brothers, I say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ. Did they put their faith in Christ? David not only put his faith in Christ. According to Peter, he was able to see and then speak about, write about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. Paul says, 2 uh, uh, Timothy 3.15, uh, speaking of the Old Testament scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through Jesus Christ. How, how could they... Um, bear fruit in faith in Jesus Christ unless they are a revelation of Christ. Um, question 11 summarize the differences between and similarities between the Old Testament and New Testament dispensations. Um, this is a this is a a in one sense, it's a huge subject. Um, so let's. You didn't give us that much space. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Um, where is page 29, 30, 31. All right, so. Let's read the paragraph six. Under the gospel, when Christ the substance was exhibited, the ordinances in which this covenant is dispensed are the preaching of the word and the administration of the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper. Though fewer in number and administered with more simplicity and less outward glory, yet in them it, it is held forth in more fullness, evidence, and spiritual efficacy to all nations both Jews and Gentiles, and is called the new covenant. There are not, therefore, two covenants of grace dif differing in substance, but one and the same under various dispensations. Right, so summarize the differences between uh, the two. So the, well, where am I, where am I going to answer these questions? Um, so what, what the confession is saying is that the, the differences between, according to the confession, they are differences that are external, they are matters of administration. Um, the similarities are, they're all about grace, faith, uh, yeah, good. Okay, yeah, thanks for pointing that out. 
um, I'll have to uh, correct that. Uh, so similarities and differences. So the confession is maintaining that the, the, the differences between the two are superficial. So they, ha they had a covenant meal, Passover. We have a covenant meal, Lord's Supper. They had, um, they had uh, uh, an, an, a, a right of admission, uh, circumcision. We have a right of admission, uh, that of the, of the, um, of, of baptism. Um, th th that the, the point of the, the Old Testament is like is a, a signpost that is pointing forward to Christ. And so with the, the um, I guess the other thing we'd want to say here, the one, this one is anticipates and, and the, the, new, the new covenant then um, fulfills. So if you, th you think of every aspect of the, of the Old Testament, they had high priest, Christ is our high priest. They had lambs, Christ is the lamb of God. Um, they had a temple, Christ is our temple, right? Doesn't Jesus say, tear down this temple, I'll raise it up in three days? So everything about the Old Testament system was temporary by nature, um, it was anticipatory, meant to point to Christ, uh, and, and uh, is fulfilled in Christ. Um, similarities, then, are the underlying principles which are operative. That is, that we are saved by faith, saved by grace, saved by Christ. That's, uh, that's, that's the argument. Um, so, looking at... Uh, further at uh, some of these um, scripture passages. Um, Abraham. Abraham received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who would believe without being circumcised, so that righteousness would be counted to them as well. So what was circumcision? It was a seal of the righteousness that he had by what? By faith. Circumcision was a sign of justification by faith. Uh, we'll see the implications of that when we look at baptism. What uh, Hebrew then apply that sign to an eight day old infant, even though it's a sign of justification by faith. So we p ponder, that, ponder that one for a, a while. Um, uh, in him, in Christ, you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism. All right, back up. What's, what's baptism being called? It's being called the circumcision of Christ. So that's why we associate baptism equals circumcision. We see this with both of these passages. They are analogous to each other. They are, they are functioning in the same way. They are the right of admission. They are a sign of justification. Uh, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. So going back to paragraph 5, uh, the covenant was differently administered in the time of the law and in the time of the gospel. That's what we're saying. Um, under the law, it was administered by promises, prophecy, sacrifices, circumcision, the Paschal Lamb, and other types and ordinances delivered under the people of, God, people of the Jews, all for signifying Christ to come, which were for that time sufficient and efficacious through the operation of the Spirit to instruct and build up the elect in faith in the promised Messiah. I think that that's the Bible's uh, understanding of itself and its message in the promised Messiah by whom they had remission of sin and eternal salvation and is called the Old Testament. All right, question number 12. How do dispensationalists differ with uh, confession, the confession and, and uh, reform theology? So I think that the way to think, to talk about this is in terms of continuity versus discontinuity. Continuity versus, so what covenant theology 
emphasizes is, con is continuity between the Testaments. Um, it sees discontinuity when it comes to worship because it understands that in terms of these types, the temple and everything in connection with the temple, so the temple, the priesthood, the labors, the altars, the sacrifices, um, the, temp the temple building itself, all those were anticipat uh, anticipatory, they were temporary, but uh, the fundamental principles are the same. Saved by faith, saved by grace, saved by Christ. We have a covenantal meal, they had Passover, we have the Lord's Supper, they had a, they had a rite of administration, theirs was circumcision, ours, was ba ours is baptism. All right, so we see continuity except in those specific ordinances that Christ that were, that were foreshadowing Christ and when, since Christ has come they don't continue. So the problem with dispensationalism is that they see discontinuity where they should not see discontinuity. They want to say the Old Testament is a period of law. We say no, they, Moses wrote of me, Jesus says. Abraham looked forward to my, ba my day. Uh, Galatians 3, God, uh, Abraham had the gospel preached to him. Um, he received the sign of circumcision, the sign of justification, the faith that he had while uncircumcised. Uh, so we, we, we see continuity, they see discontinuity. They say, no, the Old Testament is all about law and you don't have grace and faith until Christ comes. So where we see continuity, they see discontinuity. Then if you flip on the other end and you go with Roman Catholicism, they see continuity where they should see discontinuity. So they say, well, you got priests in the Old Testament, don't you? So we have priests. You have temples, we have a temple. They have altars, we have an altar. They have labors, we have a labor. They have priests, we have priests. Uh, they have, they're, 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 their church buildings are sacred. They are holy places. Uh, uh, the Old Testament, ours are holy places. So what's, what's the problem there in terms of our understanding and the relationship between the covenants? They're seeing continuity where there should be discontinuity. The types that foreshadow Christ are done away with. So the dispensationalists, they fail to see the continuity. Say by faith, say by grace, say by Christ, rite of initiation. And so when we get to baptism, that's going to be crucial. We're going to say, look, circumcision, eight-day-old infant receiving the sign of justification by faith according to Romans 4.11 that we just read. It's, baptism is the circumcision of Christ. Why would you withhold that from your children? We see continuity. They circumcised them when they were eight days old. Why would we not baptize them? Um, so that's where we, we're seeing co continuity, but the, the Roman Catholics are refusing to see the discontinuity. All right, so that's why they, they are what they are. That's why they have an altar. We have a pulpit. That's why they have a priest. We have pastors. That's why they see the Mass as a sacrifice. It's a, sac it's a sacrificial understanding of the Mass. They are presenting a sacrifice, which according to the Council of Trent, propitiates. That's the language they use. So you have a priest presenting a sacrifice on an altar in a temple, and he's wearing priestly garbs. He's got a surplus and the rest. He's dressed up like a priest. Why? Because they don't see the discontinuity. A dispensationalist also sees continuity where there should be discontinuity, at least with respect to their treatment of Israel as Israel. Because mm. they insist on the continuing significance of Israel as a not as the people of God, which... Yeah. Okay, good point. Good point, right. Um, so uh, according to classic dispensationalism, there are two people of God and they, they remain distinct forever. They remain distinct in heaven. Um, it was, I think, very effective of my Old Testament teacher in England um, to, to use the phrase the people of God. That was characteristically what he would say. So he's teaching the Old Testament. He just talks about the people of God. They're the people of God. We're the people of God. So it, uh, it was a very effective way of just seeing the continuity of the Bible. God's working with them, he's working with us. They're his people, we're his people. Um, at the end of Galatians 6, we are the Israel of God. You know, la uh, Peter's language in, in 1 Peter chapter 2, we are that royal priesthood, a holy nation. Um, we are the, you know, we are a, a priesthood. He uses all the, these titles of Israel and he applies them to the church. So again, we see in that respect, we see continuity with the Old Testament people. We are the people of God. They were the people of God. 
We are the heirs, you know, at the end of Galatians 3, we are the sons of Abraham, heirs according to the promise. Um, so if you, if you think in terms of a kind of a, a stream, you know, f coming out of the Old Testament, um, what, 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 what goes, what, what the, the end point of the stream is the church and Judaism branches off this way. That would be, I think, the New Testament self-understanding, is that we are the people of God. We are the continuing people of God. We are the sons of Abraham. We are the, the sons of the covenant, another a phrase from Galatians chapter 3. So it's, it's really a, cru a crucial issue. Do you see continuity or discontinuity? Again, with dispensationalism, the law has no place whatsoever in their scheme. Free from the law, absolutely, they don't want nothing to do with the law. They don't want anything to do with the Sermon on the Mount, for that matter. J. Vernon McGee, you know, classic dispensational preacher. Uh, that's, uh, that's for the kingdom. That's law. Doesn't see that as for the Christian. Uh, I would see, only see the epistles, basically, as for the Christian. Is that right? That's true. Yeah. Right, exactly. So... Um, the, the, the continuity discontinuity question is a, is a crucial one. Terry, were they, you know, the the, the the clarity and the confidence that they have in their 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 present presentation of covenantal theology feels very modern, almost like almost like a response to modern day dispensationalism. Were their movements back then? they were trying to respond to? Because I know dispensationalism as we know it today didn't exist back then. But were they, like it almost seems remarkable that they are speaking so clearly about covenant theology in the 17th century. Were they responding to, to, to discontinuity thinking from other theologians at the time? Um, they were responding to Anton, no, I don't think so. I don't, there were um, antinomians so who had, with dispensational, saw, saw no place for the law. Matthew, I have to say it. There were Baptists who didn't see the continuity with baptism. And they still don't. Uh, so I think they were dealing with some of the same issues, but not, you know, dispensationalism only um, arises in the 19th century, Jay and Darby and, and the Plymouth Brethren. By the way, there's a new book out on the collapse of dispensationalism. It's amazing. It was the dominant theology among evangelicals, and it's all but collapsed in our day. It's, um, it's amazing. So there's, there's the point for question 13, dispensationalism and continuity, high church theology and discontinuity. They failed to see the continuity. They say it failed to see the discontinuity as a generalization. And then question 13, what was question 13? Um, See if you can draw out practical implications of the confession's view of the covenant into such areas as sacraments, child rearing, training, the law of God. Well, I'm touching on those now, the sacraments. Continuity. Differ so it's a good illustration. Difference of administration. That's the point. External superficial differences. But the meaning is essentially the same. They had a covenantal meal. We have a covenantal meal. Theirs is Passover. Ours is the Lord's Supper. Um, baptism. You know, administration, it's different. It's not circumcision. It's universalizable, right? It can be applied to women. Circumcision was not. Uh, so the administration, it's, it, the difference is external, relatively s superficial, skin deep, as it were, but it's the right of admission. It, it, it occupies the same ground. It's uh, fundamentally the same in, meeting, in meaning. They applied it to... Uh, uh, they applied their circumcision to eight-day-old infants, even though it was a sign and seal of justification by faith, according to Romans 4.11. So we apply ours to infants as well and bring them into the covenant community. Uh, the law of God, um, well, child rearing, we claim the promises. This is in connection with baptism, but does, is it still true that I will be a God to you and to your children? Is it still true I will be a God to you and to your children? We think so. We claim it every time we do a baptism. Uh, this promise is for you and for your children. Um, Acts uh, 2.39. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7.4. Your children are holy. And he's talking there to um, uh, situations where a believer and an unbeliever are married and, 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 and that union produces a child. Is the child 
to be regarded as part of the covenant community, or is he somehow poisoned by the relationship by the pagan, the unbeliever, so that the child is, is uh, somehow polluted by that union? No, Paul says the child is holy. Remarkable, really. This infant is holy? Yeah, he's, uh, you know, th there's a different status. There's a believer, there's unbeliever, and then there's the children of believers, and they have a special status. Paul, Paul says they're holy. Um, and so we, we, that makes a difference on how we raise our children. We teach them the Lord's Prayer. We, we teach them to pray our Father as though God were their Father. And he was as, as, as not as though we had to wait until they, they made a public profession of faith and, and we were sure that they were adopted into the family and only then could they call God their Father. No, we, we, we teach them, we bring them up as Christians. We teach them to pray and to, and to confess their sins in Jesus' name and to claim the promises of the gospel. And then, of course, the law of God, cru a crucial continuity. Were, were they saved by law keeping? No, they weren't. No one ever was. That was never the point. Uh, we read the Ten Commandments every Sunday night, right? How do we begin? What's the prologue to the Ten Commandments? I am the Lord thy God who brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. To whom is the law being given? It's being given to a redeemed people. You know, not to fulfill the law and I will bring you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. No, you've been redeemed, you've been saved, I brought you out. Now, here's how you're to conduct yourself. Romans 8, 4, the just requirements of the law are fulfilled in those who believe, in those who walk according to the spirit, not according to the flesh. So, were they saved by law-keeping? No, they're saved by faith, saved by grace, saved by Christ. Were they given a law? Yes, as the revelation of the will of God, as what pleases God. Are we saved by faith, but saved by grace, saved by Christ? Yes. Do we have the law to keep? Yes. So we have a whole chapter on the law that we'll get to later. All right, any final questions? We've gotten through the first 13, and uh, so finish up this section uh, for next time. Uh, any other questions? Yes. I think that only those who have the benefit of the mediation of Christ have the certainty that God will hear their prayers. So I, I wouldn't presume to say that God doesn't respond to the prayers of an unbeliever. I, I think that that's saying too much. Yeah, I think that I think he hears everyone's prayers, but no one else has any assurance that God will grant the, pra the requests of the prayers that are being made. We do have that promise. They do not. Yes, Warren? We're talking about the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. There are Bibles that are not labeled New, Old Testament and New Testament. Was it always so, or was there a point where they were labeled differently, like New Covenant Old Covenant, or was it Law and the Gospel? Or is that an English translation thing, or did it like that? I think it's through the Latin. Mm -hmm. I th yes, I think it, it, it's, it's, that it's Septuagint. Uh, there, was only, there are two Greek words that could have referred to covenant. And testament was the better of the two words. It said more than the other word that was used. The appetite. So that would be the application. Okay, any other questions? <clears throat> Were covenants always uh, sealed with blood? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I mean, in an ongoing way, because we don't have bloody sacrifices, um, and we seal the covenant with the Lord's Supper on an ongoing basis. Which is symbolic of the blood of Christ and simultaneously a meal. Yes. Covenantal meal confirms the covenant. Uh, what, what did you ask, Warren? I was asking, was it always so in the English Bible or before we labeled the Bible Old Testament? Oh, I know what, I know, okay, that triggered my, my one, one last thing. You know my revered Old Testament teacher, Alec Motier. He said the piece of paper separating the Old Testament, he said of it that uh, separating the Old Testament from the New Testament, he called it the abomination of desolation. <laughs> <laughs> he did not like the message being sent by that. One book, one Bible, one message, 
salvation by faith, by grace, by Christ. All right. <laughs> Just through 21? Yeah. yeah.